Let's get ready for the word. Um, let's, let's bow our head and let's pray. Father, we just thank you. We thank you that in this moment, right now, you are speaking directly to our lives and to our hearts. Father, we fix all of our attention on you. God, right now, I pray, Father, for anyone in here that's going through a difficult season in their life, a rough patch. Maybe they just got a bad report from the doctor. Or maybe they just heard some terrible news, a tragedy in their family or in their friends. God, I pray right now you would encourage them that after today, God, they would be filled with hope and life. And today they would leave knowing that you are for them, you have a plan for us. And God, there is a way out, Lord. And all things work together for good. We trust you this morning. For all those online right now, we pray you would touch every home, touch every family, God. Let your presence come alive in every single home and a family, every person watching online right now. Let them encounter your presence and your power. Father, we invite your presence here in this place. Speak through me, and I humble myself before you. In Jesus' name, and we all say, amen. amen. You may be seated. Give your neighbor a high five on your way down. Praise the Lord. The title of today's message is The Fight for First. Someone say the fight. Let's say that again. Say the fight for first. You know, all of us have this innate desire to shoot for first place. We want our teams to win first place. A lot of you guys are repping a team right now. I can see it in the audience. A lot of jerseys in the place. I'm not going to say who because I don't want to start commotion. But a lot of us want our teams, want our friends, want our families. We want first place. It's a fight for it. But not only that, did you know that in the spiritual realm, there is a fight for first place in your heart? Right now, as we speak, there is a battle going on. The enemy wants so badly to sit at the throne of your heart. But the only way that the enemy can ever sit down at first place in your life is if you give him permission. The person or the thing that's sitting in first place in your life right now was put there by you. No one, out, no one forced himself there. Nobody can pray uh, for you and make God number one in your life. A praying mom or a praying grandma, it can't work. Whoever's first place in your life, in your heart right now, was put there by you. And here's some other news. Someone or something is sitting on the throne of your heart right now. It's not an empty seat. It's not a place where uh, 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 no, one, no one ever comes and goes. Someone or something is there right now. And it was placed there by you. So the question is, who is sitting in first place in your life? Because right now there's a fight for first. And if we don't wake up, church, we can, the enemy will gladly take that seat if it's available to him. Today we're going to talk about how the enemy fights for first place in your life. How God fights for first place in your life. And what's our role? What is our role in this fight? to place God as first place in our life. Are you guys ready to jump in with me? Who's ready to jump in this fight? Let's do it, let's talk really quick. The first point I wanna bring up is that Satan is fighting for first in your life. You know that Satan failed in his attempt to be first place in heaven. There was a time, his name was Lucifer, and as an angel, he tried to equate himself with God, steal the honor from God, and he wanted to be greater than God. He wanted to be worshipped. But there was only one person that's supposed to sit on the throne in heaven, and that's God. So God kicked him right out of heaven and sent him down. It says to the pit. But now the enemy is looming around, looking around for people now that will give him first place in their heart. See, if the enemy couldn't have first place in heaven, the, be the next best thing is first place in your life. Why? Because you were made in the image of God, and the enemy wants so badly to steal, kill, and destroy your life. I know this isn't a popular Sunday morning message, but I think it's okay that we talk about this. 
Look at what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. We're going to preach some truth today. I hope that's fine. The word says, stay alert. Someone say, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. You have an enemy, church. We have an enemy. And this enemy is not playing nice. The enemy is not sympathetic to your life and your situation. You know, the devil doesn't go around and, you know, send his demons to beat somebody up. And then the demons are beating him up so bad, the devil looks over and goes, hey guys, that's enough. Let little Johnny up. He, he's, let's give him a break. We'll, we'll go back at it again tomorrow. But to, he's just, I feel bad for the guy. There is not an ounce of love, sympathy, or truth in the enemy's objective for your life. The devil wants so badly to exchange with you. He's willing to give you pleasure as long as you give him position. And the position he's going for in your life is number one. That's why this scripture says, stay alert. Someone say, stay alert. stay alert. And we especially have to be alert because the enemy is sneaky. The enemy does not come with a pitchfork and horns. The enemy comes as a drug. The enemy comes as a, as a lustful relationship. The enemy comes as a little bit of compromise. Man, this is not so bad if I watch or I do this. It's not so bad if I go there. The enemy comes with just a little inch. The enemy just wants just an just a inch in the doorway. The enemy just wants a little hair. If you can give the enemy an inch, then the chances are we can give the enemy one more inch and then one more. And then before you know it, we're so far gone from the path that God has for us. And the enemy is now sitting on the throne of our hearts. It's the enemy's desire for our life to steal, kill, and destroy all the good things that God has for you. Scripture goes on to say, in 1 Peter 5, 8, he prowls around like a roaring lion. Has anyone ever seen, like National Geographic or something, those videos of a lion hunting? When a lion hunts, a lion is very smart about not being visible. A lion will do whatever it can to hide, to come quietly, and to approach and the enemy, I mean, the, the lion is the enemy. The lion is looking for the vulnerable. Or not just the vulnerable, but the one that is falling away. And see, right now, we're in it. We're starting this year off, and you're in the house of God. And maybe you're coming back to church for all, you haven't been here in a while. Can we give everyone a round of applause? You're coming back to church, and you're making a decision to follow God and be in the house of God. All those online you're watching, those in the overflow you're watching right now, you're here in the house of God. This is where you need to be. This is where we need to be. But the enemy is looking for the one that's willing to start drifting away from the body, drifting away from the pack. And the enemy is prowling and looking. And it goes on to say, looking for someone to devour. The enemy wants to devour, to take everything. The enemy is fighting. The enemy is strategizing. The enemy is looking right now for anybody that's willing to give him a little inch so that he can eventually sit at the throne of your heart. And the only way that he got there is not because he forced his way, was because we opened it up to him and we said, come on in. The enemy's fighting, but we need to stay alert. Someone say, stay alert. And realize that when we, are put, when we are refusing the will of God, when we're fighting God's will for our life, we are allowing the enemy's will to take over. Satan is at work in the hearts of those that refuse God's will. That's where he rules. The enemy rules in people's lives, in our lives, when we reject the will of God and we say, God, not today. God, I don't need you. God, I'm not going to church. God, I'm not praying. God, I'm not reading my word. I'm good. I'm fine. I got it. At that moment, that's the very moment that we've removed God from the throne of our heart and we put the enemy there. That's what the enemy's looking for. And he rules in places 
where the will of God is rejected. Let's look at this. Ephesians 2, chapter 2 says this. It says, you used to live in sin. How many remember those days? Hallelujah. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers of the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. The enemy is at work. It's crazy to think that the enemy doesn't take no breaks but yet we think we're okay just checking in with God once or twice a year when the enemy is 24 seven working to try and rule and conquer our lives. Now, I know you might be thinking, hey, why are we talking so much about the devil? You know that, that, uh, that in scripture, Jesus taught more about hell than probably a lot of other things. Why is it? Because it's important that we talk about the truth. This isn't, just a, uh, this isn't just sunshine and daisies. There is an enemy that's out to steal, kill, and destroy. But I thank God that Jesus came and conquered the devil. He stomped on the devil's head. And he stomped on the serpent's head. And he conquered sin and death so that no chain or bondage could ever take you out. And nothing can touch you. And we're going to get to that point in just a second. I know you know where we're going. We're going to go there. He says... Say, God's will for your life cannot be forced onto you. You must decide to follow Jesus and to obey. Here's a, a really interesting point. When Satan is first in our lives, we always lose. The result of putting Satan first, the result of putting the enemy first, our flesh, our sin, is that we always end up with more destruction and chaos but the contrary is true. This is where the good news kicks in. Whenever God is first in our lives, things always work out and we always win. It doesn't matter how tough the storm is right now. It doesn't matter how much weight is on your shoulders at the moment. Whenever God is number one in your life, you will win in Jesus name. You will come out of this victorious. I know you probably got a bad report. Trust God, he's got you. I know you probably, your family may not be all together right now, but keep praying and seeking him. They will come around. Your sons will come around. Your daughters will come around. Your family will come around. Keep praying, keep seeking. God has got a plan for your life and it's a good plan. So Satan is fighting for first, but not only is Satan fighting for first, God is fighting for first in our lives. First place belongs to God, no other person. There's no other thing that can fit in first place in our heart. Only God knows how to steer and direct our lives. Only God can do it. He's the only one that should do it. Your money can't. Your job can't. Your relationship can't. Of course, we know the drugs can't. A lot of these things that we tend to run to and, and seek for our validation or for a sense of peace or a sense of hope, none of those things end up working at the end of the day. That's because the only person fit to be first place in your life is God himself. That's why the relationships maybe don't have the peace you need. Maybe in the home, there's not the same kind of peace or hope or life in your home right now. I understand things may be chaotic, but maybe we get back to putting God first and giving God control of our life. Like the old song says, Jesus, take the wheel. Yes, God, take the wheel, take the passenger seat, take the back seats, take the trunk, take the engine, take, every, take the garage, take it all, God. I need you to take everything. I, I got too much mess in my life trying to, trying to do it my way. God, I need you to step in and take Take full control of my life. How many are saying, I need Jesus to be first in my life? It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. God's showing us this, that the priority, the priority in our lives of who is first, who is second, who is third, is all determined by, someone say me. You determine who's first in your life. And God is giving you specific instruction. He's saying, have no one else on top of me. If I'm number one, everything else will begin to flow. Everything else will begin to come in order. Everything else will begin to come under my covering, my blessing, 
my instruction for you, my favor, my destiny. I got it all planned out. I, I knew you since before you were born. No one else can say that except me. This is what God is saying for you. And I got a plan for your life. Put me at number one and I'll take care of everything in your life. You can trust me. This is what God is saying. Put me first. Have no one else in front of me. It says in John chapter 4, verse 23. But the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. God is looking. The same way that the enemy is searching and looking for someone to devour, God is looking for worshipers that have him as first place in their life. People that are willing to say, God, I need you above everything. God is looking for the man or the woman that says, God, I humble myself. I can't do this life on my own. I need you as number one. My sin has overcome me. My, my depression is overcoming my anxiety. But God, I need to give all of this to you. I cannot do this alone. I need you, God. I need a savior. I need Jesus. You know, when I was younger, I grew up in a home where, with, with drug abuse, my, my dad died when I was nine years old. He had lung cancer. He was, a, he was smoked a lot. My mom was addicted to drugs and alcohol. But eventually, my mom had an opportunity to give her life to Jesus, and she surrendered everything. She surrendered her life to Jesus. But I remember seeing her at a young age and seeing the, the, the lifestyle that she would live and you know, I didn't have any, I didn't have any major dreams or vision for my life. I just thought that's what life was. This is how you deal with problems. But when my mom got saved and she began to grow in her walk with God, she always taught me one thing. One thing she still to this day will call me and remind me. She'll tell me, son, humble yourself. Can't do it without God. As a matter of fact, you can't do anything without God. My mom tells me that. You can't do anything without God. You need him. Times when I, uh, I, I, my head gets a little too big, she comes around and pops it like a bubble. That's what mom, a good mom does. She comes to me and she, t she speaks life into me. And you know what that's done for me? It's helped me to realize this. And, and I still to this day, I got to go back to that word. I got to go back to that word. But it's helped me to realize this, that nothing I do as gifted, as talented, or as sharp I can try to polish myself up to be, there's nothing I can do to, uh, nothing I could do that's any benefit without God. I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't be up here preaching to you without God. I can't, I can't pray for someone without God. I can't have any sense of peace in my mind without God. I can't have a marriage without God. I can't, I, can't, um, I can't thrive. I can't grow without God. There's a lot of things that I could try and do for myself and only get so far, but God has everything that I need. And so all I got to do is humble myself before the Lord and say, God, I can't do this. I've been sitting in my own throne of my heart. I put myself first, but God, I'm putting you first from this moment forward God you are number one God's looking for true worshipers that say God you're number one true worship isn't trying to be fancy true worship isn't trying to memorize Christianese true worshipers are people that humble themselves before God that come to the altar and lay their life down here and turn around and turn to God and never look back that's who God is looking for people that are devoted to him how many devoted people to Jesus we have in this place? God desires to be first with no close seconds. No close seconds. And the reason why God doesn't want a close second is because when we have something that's playing a really close second, maybe close to first place, then we're always bouncing around our loyalty from one thing to the next. On Sundays, God's got you, and God's got your devotion, and God's got your heart and your attention. But then come Monday, maybe something that was a close second starts to steal your affection and your devotion. 
But come Sunday, you're devoted to God, and then come Monday and throughout the week, we're battling our, the loyalty, our loyalty is battling between God and a close second. This is why God says in Luke 14, 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, in the sense of indifference to or relative disregard for them in comparison with his attitude toward God, he cannot be my disciple. What is God saying? There should be no one, not even in our family, that competes with our loyalty for Almighty God. And you may be thinking, wow, that's messed up. I gotta, it doesn't, uh, here's the idea. Of course we're gonna love. Of course we're gonna love our family. But the, the idea is we love God so much that in comparison, it's almost like they, they don't even come close to shifting my mind or my affection or my devotion to God. God is number one and nobody else. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. I'm a better husband to my wife when she's second place in my life, not first. And she's a better wife to me when I'm second place in her life, not first. Who's first in our lives will always be God. God will be number one in our lives. And we become better husbands and wives after that point. We become better mothers and fathers because of that. We become better brothers and sisters because of that. When God isn't first, we can't do our relationships right. But when God is first, things come into order. That's why Matthew 6, says this. But first and most importantly, seek, aim at, strive after his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing things, his way of being right. The attitude and the character of God. Strive after these things first, and all these things will be given to you also. Well, God is saying it's simple. I didn't create life to be complicated for you. I made the equation very simple. Me, number one, everything else is in order. That's it. That's the equation of life that God has given us. That's the secret to life. The secret to life is this, God, number one. That's it. Say it with me. God number one. There's no other secret. There's no X factor. There's no seminar. There's no, uh, uh, you know, juice that you could drink. There's no bracelets you could wear. There's no astrology map uh, stars alignment that could happen that could all of a sudden shut your frequency and now you're just having a great week out of nowhere. None of that's going to work. God number one, that's the secret to life. Put them on the throne of your heart and everything will come into order. If you've been lacking peace, put God number one. If you've been lacking joy, put God number one. If you've been living check to check, or you've been living in poverty, or you've been living without the abundance of God, put God number one, and trust me, God will take care of the rest. Do you believe that, church? Come on, if you believe that, give God a shout of praise tonight, today. Now the big question. We know that Satan fights for first. We know that God fights for first, but I told you I was gonna tell you this part. What is our place in this fight? Where do we now step in? What can we do now to dictate who's sitting in first in our life? This is our fight to put God first. How do we keep God first in our lives during this war for first? First thing we gotta do is cry out to God. We gotta cry out to God. You know, one of the first steps to putting God first is just admitting that he hasn't been there. If we can't acknowledge that God hasn't been first in your life, then we can't even get the freedom to put him there. Today's the day. If God hasn't been first, it's time to cry out to him. And put him first. Look at James chapter four, verse seven. It says, so humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. For your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. You know why he's saying that? Because sometimes when we have a real heart check, we start to realize 
that we've been playing this game with God. We, 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 uh, we call on him when we think we need him or we want him, and we push him away when things are going fine in our life. And we need to get to a point where we finally say to God, God, I'm so sorry that I've had you as third, fourth, fifth, last place. God, none, it doesn't matter if you were third or a hundredth. You weren't first in my life, God, and I'm sorry, and I need today to put you first in my life. That's step number one, cry out to God. Step number two, how do I, how do I win this fight? How do I put God first? Bring God your best. Bring God your best. Now you may be thinking right now, just even as I said that, my best is just not good. My best right now, I, I don't have a best. I'm at my lowest moment. Internally, I'm just, I'm going one day at a time, but the reality is I'm dying inside. I haven't grown in five years, 10 years. I've been in the same boat. I've said it over and over. This is gonna be a different year and this, is, this time's gonna be different. I, I, I just can't seem to break out of the level I'm at right now. You know that God doesn't need you to try and go out and fix your life and bring it back to him. As a matter of fact that when people try to do that, they end up getting it wrong altogether. God wants you to bring everything you have to him now. If your best is, is just to, you, whatever it is that you have, give him your life. What your best is is your whole heart. Your best is what he wants is your attention. What he wants is your devotion. What he wants is your focus. What he wants is your whole heart. He wants everything that you can give him. Bring him your very best. Don't give God sloppy seconds. Don't give God just a, you know, a check-in. Hey, God, I'm going to check in, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be back next week. I'll see you later. Give God everything. Give God your heart. Watch what he can do in and through your life. He can do something in and through your life like never before. Another way that we put God first and we give God our best is, is when we, 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 well, this is, we determine who's first in our life and who we're giving our best to. And, and, and this is what I know. There's people, there's things in your life that you won't flinch at giving your best, even your increase. God, uh, you get blessed or you get a promo, promotion, or you get paid. And the first place that you run, that's a good indication of who's sitting at first place in your life. And you know what God, uh, what God is commanding us to do and calls us to do? is don't just put me first in your words, put me first in your action. And you know that old saying, put your money where your mouth is? Uh, uh, and it's not scripture, but I think we can talk a little bit about that today. Who's first in your life? Well, I, can, I really know that based on where I give, where I sow my seed. Oh God, oh here we go. God, he just wants our money. God just wants my money. The church just wants my money. Talking about money, okay. So. Here, let me ask you this. Do you think that God can have your whole heart and you not, still not get, be willing to give God your best? Let me say that again. Do you think that we can serve God as number one and trust him in every area of our life except our finances? You know, the finances are such a, play a huge role in, 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 in marital issues. They play a huge role in families and all sorts of things. And when we put our finances and we keep them away from God, God cannot do anything to touch or to bless our own finances. God's not looking for your checkbook. God wants your heart and your devotion and your trust and your dedication to him. Now, why is that? Because when you can trust God with your finances, you can trust God with every area of your life. And you know that to be true. God doesn't need, you know, a, an allowance. God doesn't need a tip. God needs your heart. And the Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart it will be also. Where I decide to invest, that's where my heart is. Where I decide to give, that's where my heart is. Where I don't hesitate to pull out my card, yeah, let's buy all of those. Let's do this. Let's subscribe to every streaming platform known to man. 
and pay every single month. When I'm doing that without hesitation and I refuse to bring God my best in my finances, I think right at that moment, we need to have a heart check and say, is God number one in my life? This is gonna be, I believe, one of the best and uh, biggest years of your life. I believe that. This is a year of growth for you and I. This is a year of growth for this church. Let God have your entire year. Let God have your devotion. Let God have your life. Put him as number one. One of the best ways we can do that is this thing called the first fruit offering. We talked about this earlier and we're talking about it again right now. What is the first fruit offering? What says in Nehemiah 10, 35, and we made ordinances to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of all trees year by year to the house of the Lord. What does that mean? I gotta go in my backyard and pull some lemons and bring them? No. I mean, you could, but I, I don't know who's gonna eat them, but yeah. This is what a first fruit is. A first fruit determines who's in first place. It's the first in a cycle, first in a beginning of a cycle and a time. It's the leading, it's the most important. It's the highest rank, it's the chief, it's paramount, it's the first hole. We have an opportunity to bring a first fruit only one time in a year. You can't bring a first fruit in July, you can only bring that at the beginning of a cycle. And when we bring a first fruit to God, and this is what we're saying next on January 29th, as a church, we're bringing a first fruit to God. What are we telling God? And what are we telling the enemy? We're saying this to the world. God is number one in my life. I trust him with my best. I trust him with my life. I trust him with my finances. I trust him with my health. I trust him with my family. I trust him with my relationships. I trust him with my mental health. I trust him with everything. I trust him to take care of me and my family this entire year. I'm going to give God my best and I know he's going to give me his best in return. That's what we're doing when we bring a first fruit. So this is what I want you to do, church. This is what we're all doing. Even all the leaders and the pastors are doing this as well. We're taking this envelope home. We're praying about it. We're seeking God. And during this fast and the season and time that we're in, we're believing we're gonna sow a seed into our year so that we're gonna walk in a blessed year like never before. You know, some people have even done what's something called a 365 offering. Three, six, $365, a dollar to represent every single day of the year. And all they're saying is this, every day of this year, I'm gonna have a seed in the ground so that I can have a harvest on that day. I believe every day is gonna be blessed this year. You could do maybe a first, maybe God is calling you or prompting you to bring, maybe you run a business and you wanna bring your first net profit to the house of God and say, God, I want my business to be blessed, so I'm gonna bring my best to you. Or your best could be, maybe you know what your best could be, but remember this, let's not bring sloppy seconds. Let's, let's bring our first and our best to God and watch what he does. This is what he's gonna do. I'll read this verse to you. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10. For those that are ready to do this, this is what God will do. This is a promise. Are you ready? Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce, then, someone say then. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. What God is saying is this. He will multiply your best so much that you will not have room to take it in, in Jesus' name. I believe that God is getting ready to break us through just living uh, uh, this cycled life and start to live a life of blessing and life and abundance and prosperity like we've never seen. How many believe that? That this is a year of growth for our lives. We're getting ready for that next week. God is doing something new. And the last thing I'm gonna say is this. How do we bring our best to God? Not only do we cry out to him, uh, not only are we putting him first by bringing our best but well, we put him first when we surrender our lives, when we surrender everything. It says in Matthew 16, 25, if you try to hang on to your life, 
If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. The problem today is not that God doesn't have enough for everyone. He has enough for you. He has enough peace for you and wholeness for you. He has a plan for you. The problem is that God doesn't have it written up somewhere. The problem isn't that God doesn't desire to help you. He desires to help you, he desires to love you. The problem is that we're too afraid to let go of our life and give everything to God. Trust God with your everything and you will finally find the life you've been looking for. For those that, like I mentioned earlier, are coming back to church and you're in church today, I wanna challenge you to give God this entire year. Surrender, just, just dedicate. There's only 52 Sundays a year and this, and you know, we have how many more left? 48 left, 49 left. Dedicate every Sunday to be in the house of God. I will not miss a Sunday. Be in the house, put God first. The first day of the week, put him first. Surrender your life. Don't be afraid to lose it. Give him your everything. I want you to bow your heads right where you're at. Just bow your heads right where you're at. And no one else moving. This is what we're gonna do. If in this moment, and the worship team can come out. In this moment, if you're saying, just in evaluating your heart and your life, you're saying that God hasn't been first. Maybe if you do a heart check right now, are you willing to admit that God hasn't been sitting in the throne of your heart? Something or someone else has been there. That's okay. That's the condition we all come in, we all come to God with. We all come in that condition. That's how, we pr that's how God wants us to come. He wants us to come just like you are. Bring everything, bring it all. But if in this moment you can acknowledge that God hasn't been number one, then this message is for you. The Bible says we've all fallen short, we've all sinned, we've all made mistakes, and the price for sin is death, which means eternal separation from God. But because God loves you so much, he sent his own son, Jesus, he sent his best his one and only son to die on a cross for you and I, to pay the price that we owed. He didn't owe, he didn't owe that price. He should not have gone to the cross, but he did it lovingly and willingly for you and I. And he made a way for you to inherit his righteousness, his forgiveness, and a brand new life. Today, if you feel like your life is too messed up, to give to God, or your life is too messed up to get it right now, maybe it is too messed up. Maybe you need a new life. Maybe your mind or your heart is too messed up. Maybe you need a new heart and a new mind. God has that for you today. God promises this, he says this. He says, "You, um, the old things is passed away and all things become new. Today, new things can come about in your life. And this can be a brand new year. No more repeating years. No more going through the same old things. Let's make this a year like we've never seen before. If you're saying that's me, you're willing to admit in this moment that God hasn't been number one. Maybe he's been a close second. Maybe he's been a hundredth place. But you're ready today to put God on the throne of your heart and to make him number one in your life. Then when I count to three, I want you to raise your hands all over this room and in the overflow and online. One, two, three. Just raise your hands. I see all those hands. I see those hands. I see all these hands up here. I see these hands back there. I see the hands in the middle there. I see the hands back there. I see all the hands over here. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. We're proud of you. This is what we're going to do. Let's all stand to our feet in this moment. And right now, if you raise your hand, if you raise your hand, I want you to do one more bold thing. Would you give us the honor of praying with you? and congratulating you. We wanna help you in this walk. If you raise your hand, I want you to make your way out of your seat. I want you to come up here to the front and I want us as a church to applaud and to clap and to shout and to encourage them because this is a moment that this is all about. This is what all of this is for.
Come on, they're still coming, church. This is where we get excited. This is where we get loud. Come on, we're saying, give me Jesus. Jesus, I need you as number one in my life. Nothing else but you. You can have all this world. Can we sing that one more time as a church? Come on, let's say, give me Jesus. Oh, give me Jesus. Everyone that just came up here, just look at me for a quick second. Everyone that came up to the front, we are so proud of you. This is gonna be a year like you've never seen before. No, there's no turning back. And here's the thing. I know it may have been hard to just come up here, maybe even hard to come to church today, but I promise you this, you give God your whole year, you give God everything, you keep him as first, things will begin to turn around. We're gonna pray with you. The person in front of you, they're gonna pray with you. We need lots more leaders. If you're a leader, DG leader, we need you up here, please. We're gonna pray with you. The person in front of you, they're gonna pray with you. Not only that, they're gonna help you get signed up for this class called Holy Warriors. Holy Warriors is a class, it's a class it's, that is designed to help you live out a radical Christian life. How do I live for God? How do I keep in this fight? How do I keep God first? How do I pray? Read my Bible, I don't even know where to start. We're gonna show you everything. We're gonna teach you, we're gonna train you, we're gonna equip you. And my advice to you is don't hold back. Why hold back from God? Give Him everything, jump all the way in. If there's a service that comes up, be there. If there's a class, be at that class. If you wanna grow in your walk with God, it's gonna take a fight from you, but we're gonna do that together. All of us are gonna do that together. The person in front of you, they're gonna pray with you. They're also gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna follow up on you, they're gonna text you, but they're gonna get you signed up for this class. And that's our next step. Are we ready for, to take our next step in our walk with God? All right, let's pray. Let's all bow our heads and let's close our eyes. If you're in the overflow, you can pray right now. If you're at home online, you can close your eyes and bow your heads. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you loved me enough that you sent your only son to die in my place he suffered a punishment he didn't deserve but he did it for me thank you jesus for dying on the cross and for raising from the dead so that i can be saved and set free i put my faith in you jesus from this moment forward my life belongs to you fill me now with your holy spirit make me a new creation I'll never be the same again. My life belongs to you. You are number one in my life. Say that again. Say, you are number one in my life. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say, amen, amen. Church, can we give God praise for all the souls that came up today? This probably, I don't know, 70, 60, 70 people up here giving their life to Jesus. Don't forget Wednesday, church is impartation. Let's come ready to receive an impartation from God. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I would not miss a single night. Make arrangements, be here. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then next Sunday, the 29th, we're bringing our first fruit offering together as a church. If you need more growth books, I believe we have some available. We do have some limited supply. If you haven't got your growth book, go grab it. If you need to get your ticket for Valentine's dinner, you can go ahead and do that as well in the foyer. We love you, church. Remember, if God is for you, there is no one who can come against you. God bless you, church. If you need prayer, come on up. We'd love to pray with you. God bless.